He was a morbidly obese surgeon destined for an operating table and an early death. Now he's a rebel MD who is fabulously fit and fighting to make America healthy again. This is Stay Off My Operating Table with Dr. Philip Ovedia. Hey, it's the Stay Off My Operating Table podcast. We are joined today by somebody we had on the show two years ago, and we're going to catch up. Phil, introduce our guest. Yeah, really excited. It's kind of amazing that we've gotten to the point now that we need to start circling back and catching up on the on what our guests have been up to. And we're honored to have back Texas Slim, who's been up to some amazing things, has literally traveled the world since we last spoke. Fortunately, one of his stops in the world tour was in Florida a few months ago, and we were able to uh, be in person together at a Florida Beef Initiative event. And the Beef Initiative, which I think he was just kind of getting started with last time we talked, has really taken off. Excited to catch up with him and, and talk about all that he's been up to and all that he's learned along the way. So maybe we lead off just by give, giving a little update about what you've been up to, Slim, and where you've been and where the journey has taken you over the past couple of years. It's it's good to be back. And Philip, it was really great to meet you in person <laughs> to finally shake your hand right in Florida. So that was a very good event. But, you know, whenever I started this and it's been about two years, just like you said, you know, we didn't know where this was going to go, but we knew that we were gaining momentum. And we we're gaining it fast. So as far as everywhere we've been, I've been 160,000 miles across the United States in the pickup truck. I've been on three continents. I've been on two hemispheres. I've traveled around the world basically one and a half times. And that's all because of the beef initiative. It's all because what we've created here is a decentralized market access to the best food on the planet. And that's basically regenerative beef. And so that is a lifetime of work to be able to go and do that basically global frauding and really looking at the United States in a way that most people don't do. And that's basically going through rural America to see where we are within our societies, within our communities, within our health. And so it's basically unveiled a, a very awakening type of clarity that, you know, it's time to steward as far as the truth of where we are within our food, within our health, within the cattle industry, not just locally where I live, but nationally and globally. So it's a hell of a tell. So let's, let's tell a hell of a tell today on the podcast. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. You know, and I think it is such a unique perspective that you bring to this now, because you do have that global perspective on what's going on with our food supply. And ultimately, you know, obviously the need to feed ourselves, the need to feed our communities is at the essence of our existence as human beings. And there's some concerning stuff going on in that front. So maybe talk a little bit about what you've learned as you've been traveling the globe, you know, what maybe, you know, a significant portion of our audience is Americans, what they need to be concerned about. But we do also have, over, you know, international audience, what they may need to be concerned about locally and how it all interacts, you know, because some sure. people may say, what the hell does the, you know, what's going on in New Zealand have to do with me here in Florida? But right. I think I think you're starting to put the pieces together. And I think it's a good time to do a little backstory here. You know, how do we get here, you know, and get people up to. And once again, this is not a judgment on anybody. We all got here where we are in our food systems together. And, you know, a lot of the things that are happening to us health wise or in cattle ranching, you know, it's because we trusted a system that we thought had different intentions. In my lifetime, I've seen those basically, you know, the food system change. One thing that I do come from, I come from agricultural poverty in the Texas panhandle. Whenever I was born, basically everything that my grandfather did within our family was taken away through the debt economy into the debt economy into basically the agricultural system that we maneuver in today, right? Right. 
I never got to be privy to the dead economy in agriculture. So just to put that who I am, I've never really understood agricultural except from a regenerative standpoint. That's all we did as a family was regenerative agriculture. But, okay, whenever I was 19 years old, coming from agricultural poverty, I didn't have a future in agriculture. I basically became a research analyst in big tech. I had a 25-year career in, in, in basically, you know, Austin, Texas, which is an incubator of a lot of innovation during the 90s and in the 2000s. I dropped out of big tech back in 2015, 16, and I've been a consultant uh, for years, but what I found out by looking at food, food systems, the health of a nation, our money systems, is that it, they're all pretty much broken right now. And you know this more than everybody as far as our metabolical health, right? And so what I was able to do is really look at everything from not only from a local level of how we get our food, our market access to our food, but what's going on in this global picture? Because we are living in a global world. We live in a digital world where our food systems have basically now been catered to that global apparatus. And a lot of Americans don't understand how that is. And so what I discovered is that most of America is now a food desert. You know, we used to have market okay, uh, access. Define that, define food desert. You know, I think it came out in the 90s per se, let's say in Manhattan, inner city Manhattan. You know, how do you go? You used to have bodegas. You actually had butchers in Manhattan to where you could actually go and find good quality protein, good quality foods. And that was something that we had as far as the consumer having market access to that. You look at the rest of the United States now, let's look at rural America. Let's look at small town Texas. Okay, we used to be the strongest corn fed boys out there, right? Now we have a convenience store, we have a Dollar General, and we have maybe a Walmart within 30 to 60 miles. That is what is feeding this nation collectively right now. Convenience stores, Dollar General discount stores, and basically Walmarts. That is our food apparatus. That constitutes the United States of America as a whole as one nation under God, a food desert, because we don't have market access to the same food that we had basically just 20 years ago. So used to, they said the inner city was a food desert. Rural America is a food desert where the food is actually grown and produced is now just as much a food desert as the inner cities were in the 90s. This is a big eye-opening, basically clarity moment for America we're not feeding ourselves anymore. We're being fed by multinational corporations that have taken over our distribution, our aggregated distribution of our raw materials and dispersed it across this globe. And then it comes back to us in the form of a Walmart, a Dollar General, or a convenience store. And this is basically just truth and facts. We've got all the scientific proof. We've got all the data. We've got everything. The United States of America is now a food desert. And so what you're saying is that even in the areas where the food is raised and grown, you still can't get access to fresh, real food because it gets taken out of those communities. It really gets distributed across the world. And then it comes back to us in the form of processed food, which, as we know, is not adequate to support to support our life, quite frankly. It doesn't deliver us the nutrients that we need to support life. Exactly. I mean, you, you you say it so well. I have different ways of explaining it to different people and, you know, different demographics of people. But, you know, you think about, you know, our food, our raw materials. State of Texas has 254 counties, right? We used to have 254 microprocessing centers. We were able to obtain that purity of that raw material through a processing center that first fed the community and then it fed a region. And then it got dispersed beyond that. Now that raw material, as it's still in that raw material, gets basically, let's say, a, a cow, a beef. Okay, it goes through a multinational processing center, and then it gets shipped overseas automatically. It might come back in the form of a food product that's been overly processed 10 to 20 to 40 times into something that's on the label saying it has beef in it. 
you know, but it really is. It, it's devalued so much that there is no nutritional value of that raw material that started here in the panhandle of Texas. We can't get that raw material anymore. It's against the law. You can't even sell it. And that's the problem. That's where we've been regulated out of feeding our own communities, regulated out of feeding our own children, our families. And this is what a lot of Americans don't realize because the labeling laws of America, you know, the marketing, the advertising, you know, grass fed, organic, all those are pretty much thrown out the window, man. They've been basically manipulated so much that you can't take a lot of value in that because there's so many good people that do follow organic practices or even grass-fed beef but there's so many other people especially the multinational corporations that manipulate those labeling laws into basically a deception so that's kind of where we stand in the united states of america and our health proves it our metabolical health proves it. And you're the, you're the one that can speak to that far more than I can <laughs> stay off your operating table, right? Oh, boy. Okay, let's start with the statement you made that it's illegal to buy your food that's grown locally. Expand on that for me. I'm just going to keep on referring back to Texas because Texas is where I come from and it's what I sure. speak. I just got out of a meeting and it's cottage food laws, but it's also commercial cushion laws. And this is where we get into very sticky regulatory captures. Okay. We know that you grew that beef. We know that it's your beef. We know that you know how to process that cow. But do you have the right regulations in place? Do you have the right certifications? Do you have the right basically wastewater, you know, type of setup? They've come at our food so much that if you try to go out there and you can actually be a rancher right now and you can raise a cow, you can process, process that cow in, in a barn and you can do it right. And just like you do a deer, but you cannot do anything with that beef. You could eat it yourself. You could give it to your family. But beyond that, if you try to go to retail with that, then you would be put in jail. And it's it, you're, you're seeing a lot of the, the enforcement of people that are trying to push the boundaries of our regulations of cottage food laws and basically feeding local communities, you know, not trying to disperse across the United States, maybe just keeping it in your own state. But they're basically what we say again, there's regulatory capture to where if you miss up and you don't have the resources to follow the regulations to have a commercial kitchen, let's say, or a microprocessing center to basically process beefs, lamb, pork, poultry, everything. If you're not set up correctly, then you're going to go to jail. <laughs> and there's no way that now independent producers in the United States of America can take that full integration from taking that cow from the time it's born, basically calved, and all the way to your plate, that vertical integration has been stolen from us through regulatory capital, multinational corporations, our own government, our federal laws, our state laws. And so for that to be profitable for an independent rancher producer, we that's not a possibility anymore until the beef initiative came along. And this is what we bring. We bring that understanding of that vertical integration of what you need to do to go to market with basically your own independent produced, independently produced animal. And, you know, once again, it's daunting. It's very widespread that this is a big issue. And a lot of people now, as far as cattle ranchers in, you know, across the United States, they'll take that cow calf all the way to a certain point of life. Where are they selling it? Well, they have to sell it at the auction house because they don't have access to a processing center that would give them that beef back to where they could take it to a retail store, a rancher storefront, and then sell it to their local community. That has been stolen away from us. Now, you know, the purported, let's say, motivation behind this originally was, you know, food safety. That if, sure. you know, all these independent little ranchers are doing their own thing and, you know, there might be an inclination that they're going to cut corners or whatever it is, or just not know, you know, the best way, the proper ways to do this and, and people are put at risk. So 
how much of a concern is that actually, I guess I would first ask. And then, you know, is, is that a valid concern and how do we kind of account for that in, you know, in the system? You know, and it's a great question. And it's like, where do we gauge this issue? Where is it on the spectrum to be able to look at it? You know, we're I'm really good friends now with the Because of the Beef Initiative and the networking that we've been able to do across the world with, you know, Brooke Miller. Okay, he's the past president of the U.S. Cattlemen's Association. You know, he's a seventh generational rancher in the state of Virginia outside of, you know, D.C., and it's Washington, Virginia. Just look it up. You know, Google search Washington, Virginia. He has a ranch and it's called Ginger Hill Angus. He's a cow calf operator. Okay. He knows what he's talking about, right? When it comes to cattle rancher, he's also a doctor. He's a ninth generational doctor, family doctor in the United States of America. He knows the health crisis that we're going on in the United States. He understands the food crisis and he understands cattle ranching. He's the first one to get on the tallest hill here in the United States and said, this is now a food, basically our food security is now a national security issue. And you're going to start seeing that from me and from these lips with the type of intelligence that we now have, me going around the world and what's unfolded ever since 2017, this is a national security issue. And we're about to really start launching this as far as this awareness. It's not that the sky is falling. It's time to take action in a different way than people do not understand that they're going to have to. And if they want to front run basically food security for the next 10 years, they're going to start listening to this collaboration of ranchers, doctors, intelligence experts that have gotten together and started collaborating through the Gates of the Beef Initiative. This is a national security issue. And I have not one one hesitation of saying that at this point in time. And like I said, this is a lifetime of work, but really ever since whenever I met you, Philip, you know, this is what we've discovered. This is at least four years of intelligence work that is both national, it's global, but it's community-based and it's the truth. So it's a big deal. Okay. Walk us through it. We understand that our our entire, everything that keeps us alive and healthy is being grabbed by giant multinational corporations. Fewer and fewer people control more and more of our lives. That's the easiest way to talk about it, centralization. Yeah. And you're working to create decentralization. I know it's been two years since we talked. Tell us about the progress. It's been monumental. You know, I started this, I liquidated my life and I tell everybody I've been homeless for four years. And I truly have. I don't have my name on a lease. I've owned three homes in my lifetime, but I don't have my name on a lease, a rental or anything. I've basically been going around the, you know, everywhere to do this. The reason I did the way I, you know, started the Beef Initiative, because you can't do this with money. You have to do it with grit and sweat equity. But it's about building relationships with the right people with the right intentions. That's why I'm on the podcast with you guys. I'm, I've am i met the right people to be able to facilitate this awareness. And there's nobody here being bought out. And that's what's happened in our food system. Our food system is so subsidized by the United States government that multinational corporations know how to manipulate that system. They've been making massive profits for the last 50 years. Those profits are about to be, the money's broken. You know, we're in a bad debt cycle. We're at the end of a debt cycle. The U.S. dollar is now coming to, you know, a big question mark globally. You look what Saudi Arabia is doing right now. They're saying, hey, we're not going to sign up to be on the petrodollar anymore. That was done in 1974. They're about to probably say no to that anymore. So our money is broken and our money is broken in a way that those profits that these food multinational corporations have been used to, they've got to reinvent food. And that's what's coming, this global industrial food shift. But all this really started being put into action back in 2017 with uh, some massive uh, uh, consolidation that happened on the chemical grain side of things, but also on the food industry side of things. And if you look how they've they've stewarded this, it's ingenious for one, but they're not they're in it to win it. And so they're not going to slow down and they don't have to. 
because they know that, you know, in America, we'll eat anything as long as it tastes good. And our health is starting to really reflect that. You can say it's nefarious. I don't care what it is. It's happening. So don't get stuck up in this. It's the best opportunity of my life to actually steward a decentralized system. And what that means is the processing centers are the bottleneck, especially when it comes to animal protein. Okay. And if you look at the processing centers in the lack thereof, that's where it all starts. Moving forward over the next decade, we've got to get the processing centers that we used to have. We'll take that. And it's not a big shift from the multinational system, but they're, that's where they're trying to capture all of us is through the processing center. Okay. So what's the Beep Initiative doing in that regard? What we've done, and Philip, you were part of this in our early talks, is we got to get more, you know, processing centers. We've in the beef initiative, we've been able to, through a lot of stewardship, through independent ranchers, producers, and I can name them off some names here. You know, Justin Trammell was one of the first ranchers, producers, their whole family, the Trammell family in the Texas Panhandle. They were just breaking ground on a microprocessing center in the state of Texas. Okay. It's been up and running for two years. Now it has three storefronts that it is supplying to the local community, okay? That's how vital this is. They're about to have another storefront. Four storefronts that local community are going through one microprocessing center. They don't process more than 30 beeves a week. That just gives you perspective, okay? The other one is USDA. That's a state certified processing center in the state of Texas, Okay, down in Luling, Texas, that is Cole Bolton with KNC Cattle Hometown Meats. Yeah. And basically what you were looking at there, that's a USDA regional-based processing center. Cole Bolton is already processing beeves for 400 independent producers in Central Texas right now. That just goes to show you the power of the processing center. So what the Beef Initiative has done, I've created the Beef Initiative Association Council. It's tbiac.org. Investors, people wanting to basically feed their communities again, get into the processing business because it is not a friendly business. It is like a, it's, you better put yourself on some wartime footing, basically. It's tough to do, but if you get the right people and you understand how to facilitate a microprocessing center moving forward, this is what the Beef Initiative is going to do. We're consulting people opening up microprocessing centers across the United States. But we're, it's just not about the processing center. How do you get retail storefronts? How do you basically create you know, a new skill set that's been lost, that's butchery? Processing you know, right now in the United States most of that labor is gone and most of the labor that uh, has basically subsidized our domestic labor has been foreign nationals, illegal aliens, migrants. And that just goes, that's a rabbit hole within itself that we'll have to talk about at a different time because of the mass migration that's going on in the United States. And within these multinational system, the current administration is now raiding multinational processing centers and trying to shut them down because they're hiring Ill illegal aliens. So once again, as you said, Jack, there's a lot of people working in a lot of different ways to shut down us having market access to our freedoms that we've once understood that we would have for a lifetime. They're about to put a big old prohibition on a lot of things that people take for granted. And it's, they're going to start with clean and pure food. And just to, you know, kind of so people understand, you know, why the processing center is so important, you know, again, you know, without the proper permits, let's say, you know, the you can't, you know, the beef that gets processed or whatever animal protein it is that gets processed can't be sold, can't be distributed unless you have sort of the proper permits. And on one level, you have the USDA oversight that is necessary if you're doing it across state lines. And even to do it locally, you know, in these microprocessing centers, uh, you know, again, a lot of regulation that, that needs to be uh, met uh, in order to be able to take these animals from the ranch, from the farm, 
and be able to, you know, distribute it out uh, to the people. But, you know, again, beyond that, even if you solve that problem, you then have to figure out, okay, how am I distributing this? How am I selling it? How am I letting people know that this is available and being able to, you know, sell it to them, get it to them, ship it to them if you're talking about not doing it locally? And it, yeah, I'll, I'll give you some like real time, you know, understanding. Okay, we have a beef that's raised over here one mile from me. Okay, a cow that's been raised regeneratively on Texas prairie grass. You know, it, we call it buffalo grass growing up. Some of the best protein in, in the root systems of that grass. Bison proved it for thousands of years. Okay, now that beef goes through a processing center out there in Hereford, Texas. It's where we have a lot of processing centers. Okay, that beef now, okay, it's been processed. Over 5,400 cattle get processed that same day in that processing center. That beef now, you know, is now shipped somewhere up in Nebraska. They do something to that beef up in Nebraska. Then it might come back here to get basically cut up, packaged, but then that beef probably, oh, it's not going to get sold here in Amarillo, Texas, or Canyon, Texas, or Happy, Texas, or Fulia, Texas, or Bort, any anywhere around us, that beef now automatically ships out overseas in the cover of night, okay? But in the same time that I'm saying that, we are getting beef that's being shipped in from Uruguay, shipped in from Africa, shipped in from Brazil, shipped in from Australia, shipped in from New Zealand. At the same airport, the beef is being shipped overseas or driven in a semi out to California or maybe to Florida, right? And they're just, it's amazing in the same amount of time that we could be feeding our own community, we're dispersing our beef overseas. The United States of America is now a net importer of beef. We're eating more foreign beef in the United States right now than we are eating our own supply. Our own supply now is the lowest inventory we've ever had in the cattle industry in the United States of America. Same with pork. We're now a net importer of pork and beef. Okay, this is where it gets really crazy. It's okay. Who controls that distribution, right? Who is controlling that beef once it leaves the hook after it's been processed? That's where a lot of people don't understand that that's where the capture has taken place. The distribution of our product and the distribution of that foreign product coming into our borders. And that's where it gets into a very deep level of government, you know, maneuvering multinational corporations, big time money. And you have to be, be able to pay to play in that basically aggregated distribution system. So let's follow the money. Who's yeah. the winners? The winners are right now, okay, China, of course, Brazil, JBS. What I'll is, ask some what questions. Is JBS? Here. JBS is the biggest uh, animal processing apparatus in the world right now. They're out of Brazil. They're part of an apparatus that basically the Department of Justice should be all over JBS, but they never will because they're, you know, a lot of the corruption is coming from within our own government at right. this point in time. Right. JBS manipulated the retail beef industry for a sum of $500 million of profit during COVID, and the current administration only fined them $56 million. They'll do that every day. Yeah. And so JBS has basically been propped up in Brazil and they're uh, under an umbrella. There's a big shell company called 3G Capital and it's out of Brazil. And it's part of the board. Yeah. But let's go back to, you know, that's JBS, but let's go to Tyson as well. Tyson was a domestic mom and pop company, you know, that was created a long time ago. Well, now Tyson is owned by who? Well, Smithville. Okay, who owns Smithville? The CCP of China. Okay, so we're eating Chinese pork as we're shipping our pork to China. That's what the American people do not realize. Why? And they don't realize it because of the manipulation, because of government profiteering, multinational engineering of our food laws. That's how. It's based on corruption. It's based on, you know, a, a, the almighty dollar. And so we've lost control of being able to feed ourselves. And a lot of people don't realize it. We saw it in COVID. 
you know, people, you know, the food lines, but people have already forgotten about that. Yeah. And I try to tell everybody, you know, the day that you realize how bad off it is, is a day that you will divorce the supermarket, you know, lose all this stuff about diets. You know, this is a lifestyle change. This is a behavioral change. And this is a form of awareness that, that, it, that brings you empowerment. But it's a slap in the face right now for a lot of people. But they're going to have to wake up to this because you look at what they're doing across the United States. You look about, you know, the Evian flu. There's a lot of things that are going on that they're causing this prohibition to our animal proteins. Look how many animals are calling in Europe right now. How many people are basically losing their farms in the Netherlands, Ireland, across the UK? What are they doing in Australia? Why are they killing all of our animal protein across this world? That's because it's a global industrial food shift. And they're going to start introducing fake proteins into a market that once was just for true animal protein. Now they're redefining what protein is. Tyson's one of the leaders of that. JBS is one of the leaders of that. They're trying to take the animal and the land out of our consumption model and introduce new food systems that they will basically say is healthier. It's saving the planet. And here you go. The greenwashing effect, it's already coming. My my discovery in Asia and Australia is that marketing plan has already hit Australia in Asia. It's coming to America this over the next 18 months. You're going to see a lot of things change within marketing of food and of the food label laws in the United States of America. It's about to unfold. Yeah. And to be clear, you know, obviously we're all passionate about animal protein, but the reality is that they're doing this to our vegetables. They're doing this yeah. to our fruit. You know, people go to the supermarket and, you know, buy the apple, buy the corn, whatever it is. And, you know, that food has probably made that same sort of trip around the world, like you said. And even though yeah. it might be grown next door to you, you can't access what's being grown next door to you. You're only getting what's, you know, come from halfway around the world. You know, yep. what do we do about it? You know, how do we on an individual level, start to change our behaviors to overcome this issue? One thing, don't panic about this, but do panic. <laughs> you know, go look in the mirror and say, hey, why do I desire what I desire when it comes to food? You know, we have to take that, you know, you know this better than anybody, Phil. It's like, why are we always so hungry? Why are we not basically getting fulfilled through our consumption model? And so I tell everybody, you got to basically go take a look in the mirror. The individual has to change. This is not, nobody's going to come save you. Nobody's going to save our food systems except the individual. The individual has to learn how to feed themselves in a different way. That is not a horrible thing. It's actually a gift. And so that's what the Beef Initiative has done is giving people basically a gate that they can come through, either a producer or a consumer. You can go through right now. We have so many different answers for you. Beefnews.org. Start there. Welcome to beef.com. Go to there. And it just it's never ending. But what you have to do is you have to go out there and say, I'm going to create a decentralized food system for my family. And I need to find out what those tools are. And if you're not going to use a producer, we have over 250 producers in the Beef Initiative ever since I last spoke to you. There's people feeding thousands. There's producers now feeding thousands upon tens of thousands of families across the United States through the gates of the Beef Initiative. And so you're going to be able to supply all these links and we'll talk more about it. But what you need to do is, you know, I started the, you know, shake a rancher's hand. That's what you need to do. You have to go back there wherever you may be it in Boston, be it in Miami, be it in, you know, it doesn't matter if you're in the big city or small town America, you have options, but you have to afford yourself those options. It starts up here, man. It's a mindset change. You have to decentralize your mindset when it comes to food and you have to quit thinking that, you know, Pulling over after a hard day's work at Chick-fil-A is an answer. It's not. Sorry. That's just not how you're going to feed yourself moving forward. If you do, you're going to have to answer to that person looking in the mirror. But the best thing you can do is get a new form of food intelligence and, you know, start with beef intelligence. 
come through the gates of a beef initiative. I started the beef initiative because I come from cattle country. That's in my DNA, right? This is about truth and food. What you need to do is understand that there's a new opportunity to define what truth and food is for you, the individual. I started this so we can basically, I have a 19 year old son and I refuse to let him grow up and become an adult in a centralized food system that has basically destroyed our health as a nation. And it starts through the gates of the beef initiative. And I can proudly say that we're feeding a lot of people through the gates of the beef initiative and it's going to become more and more. We need more people coming through the gates. We need people to take a pause and say, hey, I'm going to source my food in a decentralized way. I'm going to form a relationship with those people that live and die to feed me. They're out there waiting for the American public to say, OK, I'm going to take this lifestyle change. This is not about a diet. This is about health. Yes. Health of a nation, health of the individual first. And if you can take that ownership and that obligation, then you see that changing the way that you access food is going to empower your life in a way that, you know, I think that you're going to lead more so than a lot of people are right now, you know, especially with your awareness that you brought to the general public, your story, Philip, is what most Americans are, they need that entry point of understanding how to get started. Yeah. And, and, you know, just to be clear for anyone out there, you know, you can go to the Beef Initiative site and you can get beef delivered to you wherever you are, you know, in the U.S. at least, knowing at least that it came through this system, you know, yes. that it was sort of the least processed. And, you know, maybe, you know, it's not an option for you to go actually find a local ranch and buy directly, right. but that is an option. And even Trace, even uh, Slim will tell you that if you can do it that way, that's the best way to do it. You don't even need the beef initiative if you can do that. Out of curiosity, sure. like what percentage of people in the US, let's say, have that option? Like within, let's say, you know, 60 mile drive, you know, and yeah, I understand you have to put some effort into it, but within a 60 mile drive, you know, how much, what percent of the U.S. has that option that there is a local rancher that they can go to and, you know, buy beef directly? That's a great question. And I like that perspective. You know, it makes me think of, I think Tucker Carlson said I don't, a couple of months ago, he goes, Everybody in this nation needs to get in their car and drive 500 miles in one any, any direction, right? If you do that same, but you said 60 miles, I would say that over 80% of the United States of America could feed themselves right now if they got in their car, and even if they didn't have a car, whatever. If they went 60 miles in any direction, they would ever be able to feed their family for the next year without hesitation, without question especially now with a, you know, a, a platform, a multi-layered platform that the Beef Initiative is now. So that's a good thing. That's a good vision for people to have. Within 60 miles, you can feed your family for the next year or two without hesitation. And it starts with basically building a relationship with somebody that wakes up every day at 3.30, like I do, and goes out there and stewards the land, stewards the animal, stewards the community. And this is all they know. And we do not support them enough. They're being liquidated in the United States of America right now. But within a couple of years, and this is why everybody, I'm going to keep saying this URL. This is very important that people understand. Go read every article in this basically platform. It's beefnews.org. We created this system and it's a decentralized, it's a first layer of the internet. It's not an application layer. We can't be shut down with this. But you can read everything that's going on globally, nationally. But you can also, as you're reading that article, you can source your beef from a local producer across the United States. We give you all of basically the information. I call it the Amazon of clean ag. And that's how we're going to expand it out. And so go to beefnews.org and you can take care of it. If you need something beyond that, go to beefmaps.com. That's the beef initiative as well. If you're a, if you're a, basically a producer out there in the United States of America, beef.support. And so there's going to be so many different URLs that you can tap into. But if you don't want to have to remember them all, just welcome to beef.com. And you're going to be able to find everything that you need. 
And so 60 mile drive, you can establish somebody that you will send Christmas cards to every year because they're going to be feeding your family. And, you know, you think about that one cow will feed a family of four for a full year. That's perspective. Okay. One cow right now, as far as you would buy that, getting it basically processed, costs you between right now five to six thousand dollars. Now everybody go and do what your food bill is over a full year. It's a heck of a lot more than six thousand dollars. And so let's get perspective as far as it's a timing perspective, I think, whenever people don't know how to source beef or animal protein, be it hog, be it lamb, be it poultry, whatever it is, you have more options out there than a lot of people are affording themselves. Take a Saturday off, get your map out, go to beefinitiative.com, go to our mapping section. You're going to find a producer that'll feed you for the rest of your life. Yeah, no, people don't realize those economics. I mean, you're talking about basically $100 a week or so to feed a family of four. And, you know, yeah, you put the one, it literally, you know, it's going to take you one day a year to do that. You're going to have to go buy a chest freezer for, you know, a couple hundred bucks that is is going to last 20 years. And, you know, you're basically taken care of and you're lowering your risk of, someone taking that away from you, you know, someone getting in the middle of that, you know, that, like you said, all of a sudden, you know, that beef that you were previously getting from overseas can't be shipped here anymore <laughs> because of whatever, you know, global issue is going on, war, pandemic, you know, whatever it is, you know, there, there's less chance of disruption, the shorter that supply chain gets. And it is so true. Right now, people are like, ah, I got time. I got time. What happens like right now, 40% of our ranch land has disappeared over the last 15 years. Okay. Now we've uncovered, go to beefnews.org. Now within the current administration in the last four years, we've lost over 43 million acres to foreign entities now. You see what Florida did is that, you know, China can't buy Florida land anymore. Okay. We have something that's going on and it's going on within. We're selling off all of our natural resources to be able to steward ranch land, farmland. We lost 43 million acres to foreign entities the last several years, folks. Wow. Do I need to say that again? We lost 43 million acres of United States soil to foreign entities in the last several years. A lot of that land was farmland. This is happening. This is a global industrial food shift. The multinational corporations are redefining what meat is. They're redefining what food is. They're going to take the land and the animal out of our consumption models, put it into a warehouse and say that it's saving the planet and it's heart healthy, just like they do with Cheerios. And so get ready. It's coming. This is not, you know, something that is not going to happen. This is unfolding in real time. It's just a lot of people are too busy. They're being, you know, there's so many distractions out there right now in the attention economy that a lot of people are trapped in. They don't see this food shift happening on, right now. And COVID was an eye opener. So those people that woke up during COVID that are still, you know, understanding that we have issues, they're doing right now. There's going to be people that do not have market access because they wait too long. I really believe that. And once again, it's hard for me to gauge and try to, you know, tell everybody where we are as far as, you know, the alert, you know, where are we on the spectrum? It's up there. And I have children, I have family, and I will never rely on a supermarket apparatus to feed my children or my family ever again. Wow. I'm looking at the map, maps.beefinitiative.com. I live in Phoenix, and there ain't nobody in yeah. Arizona or New Mexico. There's only one in Utah, and he's a million miles away. Doesn't Let me tell like you why on that. Vegas. A lot of yeah. that, a lot of that, basically, you know, you look at that's the western part of the United States. It's yeah. different ways of raising cattle, right? Yep. We're regenerative, but what you see there is that. We have very few processing centers in that part of the country. Most of those cattle ranchers and producers are having to sell at the auction houses. That's going into the multinational system. 
So it's hard, but that's a very good eye-opening experience right now. We've got some really great independent ranchers and producers out there. We just haven't had time to get them into the beef initiative because it is open source. It's crowdsourced. Yeah. And so if you're living in these areas, then what you have to do is you have to reach out to your producers and say, hey, we need to get you in the beef initiative. There's no obligation here except that you're going to be found and you're going to have more customers, you know, coming your way. So. Yeah. I'm also looking at Nebraska. There ain't no, there's nobody in Nebraska. And of all the places I thought there'd be something like that, it was yeah, Nebraska. No, it's oh, very really interesting. It's, it is. It's very eye opening, isn't it? You look at Nebraska, that's commodity cattle country, that's commercial cattle industry, you know, just yeah. like Kansas, just like Texas. But you look in Texas, look how many pop up on the yeah, state. There's of Texas. a bunch on Texas. You know, once again, this is open source. We don't do centralized marketing. This is all word of mouth. So it's basically, hey, let's get and that's think about how many different uh, opportunities there are right now to connect all those dots. And we're just at the beginning of here, folks. And, you know, we built the platform. We've got the technology. We're ready to basically for that tsunami of new producers coming in because we have a tsunami of consumers coming in, too. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, we've, our, we've sold millions and millions of dollars worth of beef through the beef initiative right now, collectively. We should be a, we should be feeding a million people within the next year. I really think we can do that. Talk to me about this news that I keep seeing about uh, RFID tags on cattle. What's that all about? It's a... Uh, capture of our food supply system. It's a capture of our cattle industry that a lot of people don't understand. It's track and trace. You know, we basically take inventory of our national inventory different ways. They've already basically shelved the old way of doing things. Whenever you can take an inventory of our cattle in the United States from space, and you can't sell your beef anymore unless you have that data that's coming off that RFID chip, you're out of business. And so RFID chipping our cows is probably the last stance that we really, if we lose this battle, say goodbye to the independent rancher producer in the United States of America. It's as simple as that. It's data. It's data. It's data. And that data will be leveraged against the cattle producers in a way the cattle producers don't understand at this point in time. And what it is, it's a track and tracing technology that they've already used during COVID. They did it during all of the basically jabbing of everybody. The tracking, tracing of our animal protein is what they're going after. And now the same pharmaceutical industries that basically perform this type of, you know, track and tracing through inoculations of, you know, our public, they're going to do that within our animal protein as well. They're already doing it in hog. They're already doing mRNA in hog. The, you know, poultry industry is already basically consolidated. The RFID chip, you look at the cattle industry. These are independent sovereign beasts. Okay. That's what they are. They're beasts. They're bees. They're animals. They're mammals. They're, you know, they're, they're something that we've never really been able to control. But if you honor them, then you basically have, you know, society, you know, you look at society throughout the history of mankind. If we're able to track cattle, with RFID chip from space, there is no more cattle industry. It's over with. It's as simple as that. Wow. And I don't have a problem saying that. Connect the dots for me. Okay, you got a it's cow. It's obvious to me that why that's the case. You look at digital capabilities right now, and this is where I come from, research analysis. And I was in the telecommunications industry. You take an RFID chip that has basically a computer chip on it. And all that stuff that you can store on that computer chip. Okay, if you're the USDA and you are the one that says that this is clean beef or it's not clean beef. Okay, let's look at the globalists. Okay, the cow has already been declared a carbon hazard. Okay, <laughs> let's say that the United States of America, they say, yep, the, car, the cow is a carbon hazard. Okay, now that you have a cattle rancher in the middle of the Texas panhandle, and you're part of the commercial cattle industry. You have to use certain inputs. You have to use certain grain inputs. You have to use certain fertilizer. There's a lot of things, that, you know, Monsanto engineered in the 80s, you know, a technology use agreement. And our farming industry has already seen this. 
if you make one slip in basically not using the correct input protocols to raise that beef, to steward that beef, to steward the land at which you steward that beef, the USDA and now the multinational system can say, hey, we got you. We got this data here. We see that, you know, you didn't use this correct input on this cow on this day back in 2023. OK, you've basically breached your contract. You're no longer a cattle producer in the United States of America. It's just a regulatory capture and they will be able to use data that they can now monitor through space, do an inventory. That's what they say. Oh, it's for inventory. It's just for inventory. This is where they peg walk you into basically tracking and tracing and basically using it as an attack vector for you to take away your sovereignty as an independent producer. That's how we got here, folks. If we had thousands of independent producers that made this country strong through the stewardship of land and animal. This is how they monetize it and in a way that a lot of people don't understand, but this is how they can shut you down overnight. And if you basically are using, let's say the EPA gets involved with uh, this RFID chip, what water are you using to feed that cow? We know for a fact that water source is not approved by the USDA. And so we've got your data and it's all being tracked and traced through an RFID chip that's hanging off of that cow's here. And so this is where you're going. You have a computer that is now being inserted into a cow. That's what the RFID chip is. Oh. And if you look at that RFID chip, let's look at dairy. Okay, that cow's metabolical health is all screwed up. It's suffering. Let's say it's a hot day in Kansas. And so they can look at you and say that you're that's animal abuse. That's animal welfare. You're going against this. You should have had that cow under an air conditioner. And this is where they're going with it. The track and tracing through RFID chips will be used against producers. Sure, there's efficiencies. Sure, there's great things that, you know, this RFID chip could be used for. It's not going to be used for that. It's going to be used to track and trace animals in which they cannot basically corral into a system as of yet. But once they have this type of access into the metabolical health of a cow, the input systems of a cow, the travel of that cow. Let's say you can't, you, you have an RFID chip on a cow. Now, if you take that cow from Texas to New Mexico to graze on lands, you got to report to the USDA that, hey, I have some grasslands in New Mexico. I just went one mile over the border. Now they can come at you as a cattle producer say, you broke the law. That's a prohibition. You can't go across state line to basically have that cow eat on grass. You know, you're a bad rancher. You're out of business. It just, it's unlimited how they can create a level of enforcement against our independent ranchers and producers. Sure. sure. Yeah. Okay. Once I'm again, go to beefnews.org. <laughs> and you're going to find out everything that they're doing. Seriously, we wrote an article about that two weeks ago. Yeah. You know, I, I, I and I think the central message here is really, you know, you got to start paying attention to what's going on around you. And, you know, we talk sure. about it in health and we talk about it in food. And, you know, and, and we could we, we we could certainly broaden this out and talk about it in a lot of different areas that that overlap, you know, like you discussed, you know, it, it really our money supply, our educational system, you know, all of that ties into this. But ultimately, like the message that we spread around health, the good news is that you're in charge. You can fix yeah. it for yourself. You just got to put the effort in. No one's coming to save you. You got to do it for yourself. And I know it, you know, it, it's so simple, it's complicated. The biggest barrier is people's mindsets. It really is. And I found this out, you know, two years ago, I wasn't saying any of this, was I, guys? I didn't bring this mm -hmm. on the radar. Okay, that's what we've discovered over the last two years of what's going on. I knew that we were basically in trouble. I didn't know it was this bad. This election year that we're going in, if they're able to pass some of the laws that this administration is trying to scoot by, we're screwed in a lot of ways. And I don't mind being the first person to say that. A lot of our cattle ranchers don't have access to the type of intelligence that we do in the beef initiative. It's not a judgment against them. It's the, they're busy raising damn cows, man. Yeah. They're busy taking care of the land. 
And it's, you know, sometimes it's threatening to them. And I understand that, but I cannot be more, more basically clear. This is, we're not trying to scare people. We're saying, hey, you know, this is a wonderful opportunity. A lot of suffering going on in the United States right now. A lot of anxiety. A lot of people are stressed out all the time. A lot of people don't know why they don't feel good. I guarantee you, man, everybody that I've talked to that has come through, be it a producer or a consumer through the gates of the Beef Initiative, we have testimony after testimony, just like our very good friend, Dr. Sean Baker. <laughs> How many testimonies does he have of people's lives got changed by coming through his gates of Rivero and everything? Same with you, Dr. Ovedia. And what we have to remember is that our happiness usually comes through suffering. We have to suffer first a little bit. So I tell everybody, engineer your own suffering before that suffering gets engineered upon you. And that's why I started the Beef Initiative. So it wouldn't be so damn hard for people to find market access to a lifestyle that they're really yearning and they're searching for right now. We're, we're, we give people market access to basically, you know, clean beef but man, we're giving market access to, you know, a health initiative. And that's what I said, you know, two years ago. And whenever I first talked to you, Philip, whenever I told you of, you know, the idea of the beef initiative, I said, hey, this is a great American health initiative. And it's going to be led by the great American rancher. That's what we need to be. Pulled. We need both sides to join up here and to make that come true, because that's where the answers are. That's the opportunity that we have in front of us. All right, man, I can tell from our conversation how far it has come here in the last two years since we talked last. I remember when we spoke, I was a little confused, to be honest, and I think maybe it's just because things weren't as clear, and it's definitely gotten clearer. Let me ask you about, I got one more thing here in my notes I wanted to talk to you about, farmers versus Biden. Yes. What's that? It's a lawsuit okay. of some kind. You know, yeah, it's a lawsuit. And I'll say it by this. This is probably the biggest financial corruption that I've seen in agriculture in my whole life. And I was a product of the financial crisis of the 80s. That's what basically uh, separated our family's land, not because we had to, but it was the decision we had to make. We said that we're not going to be part of this system anymore. And we're going to use our land as a different form of asset. So, but in the 1980s, we suffered through a financial crisis that was farm aid. Everybody can remember that. All of us yeah. here can remember that. Willie Nelson going out there yeah. and really doing a lot. That was a financial crisis in agriculture. We have another financial crisis in agriculture that's unfolding, and it's the Farm Bureau. It's a credit Farm Bureau crisis. And what we've discovered that probably within our government, our Farm Credit Bureau has basically been sabotaged. We now have independent ranchers and producers being liquidated when they've done nothing but ex except pay their mortgages on their land or their houses or anything. And they're basically what we've done, the 43 million acres that I told you about. Okay, you have an independent rancher producer, Dustin Kittle in Tennessee. Okay, he's never missed anything. He's in agriculture. He's seventh generation, I believe, as far as a rancher, uh, farmer in America. He is a wonderful steward of land. He's a lawyer. He's an attorney. He got foreclosed on, and he never did anything close to being nefarious as being uh, not being obligated to paying off his debt. He got foreclosed on, and so what's happening now Thousands of people are getting foreclosed on the United States through the Farm Credit Bureau. And what they're doing is now, once that land has been seized by the United States, it's being offered up to the multinational, basically, entities. We're giving people that are not citizens of the United States market access to buy land up that we're seizing through the Farm Credit Bureau through a nefarious I can't say too much sabotage that's gone through this current administration. This is uh, live. It's going on daily. There's uh, teams of attorneys, law firms are working on this. And like I said, this is one of the biggest financial tool crisis 
for the independent rancher producer farmer in the United States that I've ever seen in the last 50 years. So this is going to, this is going to, something's going to come out of this. But if you read that article and what has transpired over four, this is three years old and we just brought it to everybody's attention about three weeks ago. So what we're doing is we're seizing land in the United States from our independent farmers and ranchers. And then that land is now being giving access to multinational systems to where we are selling land to foreign entities that we're seizing from domestic ownership. And, and my understanding of it is that, you know, there's supposed to be a kind of a, a, a board that these farmers yeah. can go to for help. And basically the administration just never filled the positions on that board so that the ranchers, the farmers now have nowhere to turn to, to even try and appeal these situations. Yeah. The farm credit, you know, <laughs> that's what's so ironic about this. The farm credit bureau is owned by farmers. You pay a thousand dollars. I think it's a thousand dollar fee now to be a part of it. All the farmers actually own Farm Credit Bureau, right? But now they can't even know what's going on in those board meetings. They're shut off. There is it's closed door. They don't even know what's going on into a system and the apparatus that they collectively own, and that's been done by non-action by the current administration. So that's a kind of a simplified way of putting it. Yes. Amazing. So everybody talks about being attacked, you know, by bombs and everybody right now today is afraid of Russia. You know, what's going on with World War Three? Hey, folks, it always comes from within. We're losing our domestic lands through basically financial tool breakdowns, through a basically a system that was uh, built to support our independent ranchers and producers is now being used in a, as an attack against our independent ranchers and producers. And it's being done by multinational systems that are owned by foreign entities. It's happening from within. And this is where the American public needs to wake up to this. I had no idea when I started the Beef Initiative that I'd be talking about this two years later, but I am. And it's something that we're going to have to fight all the way. Or we're going to lose market access to be able to feed our nation. Like I said, this is a national security issue at this time. And so that's why I tell everybody, you know, as far as in the health space, the carnivore space, if you're an influencer and you've got thousands of followers, you better start basically adopting a rancher and telling everybody where you're getting your beef from, because that's the biggest power move you can do right now is that form of awareness. Just support a rancher, just adopt a rancher, give a rancher a digital voice that he's never had. Be it a rancher, be it a farmer, be it a producer, somebody that's doing it right. You're getting your raw milk from somebody, you know, let's give them more market access. They don't have the money to, you know, go into the pay to play model that Google has created. We have to be that digital voice. And that's what the Beef Initiative has accomplished as well. All right. So I'm, I'm Joe Sixpack sitting and listening to this and I want to do something. I feel like the system's way too big for me to fight on my own, but the answer is start at the beef initiative, get connected to a, a rancher, a beef producer as close to your family as you can one way or another. And also promote that guy. Yeah. Just do what you can to talk about it. Go up there and they, this is what you do. You go shake a man's hand or a woman's hand, of course. And you say, hey, tell me what you do and why you do it. And you've got a producer rancher out there that wants to tell you everything on how they do it. You've just met a best friend for life and you're going to support them and you're going to learn from them and they're going to learn from you. And it's called relationship management, peer to peer, you know, human interaction. Yeah. You know, the division of interpersonal communication is real. We got to get back to human contact when it comes to food. Yeah. One thing that I didn't think that I was going to be able to do, but I was able to over the last two years is we have the I am Texas Slim Foundation, federally recognized nonprofit 503. And what that is, is we're supporting ranchers and producers all across the United States of America. Uh, Jason Rick was one of the first producers that came into the beef initiative. He received a $10,000 grant 
through the foundation. Okay. What he's doing is he's turning that $10,000 into an internship program, educational program for his community, for the next generation of rancher, but also for consumers to be able to come stay on his ranch in his Airbnb so he can engage give workshops to family that want to take a vacation, you know, farm to table, let's learn how to do it. And so people are now taking family vacations to Rick Ranches. That's W-R-I-C-H, Rick Ranches, and it's from Colorado. And they just opened up their Airbnb. They now have a rancher storefront. So that grant enabled him to be able to steward basically his digital voice to where now he has another revenue stream. He's basically one of the best regenerative educators out there. And so he's educating the next generation of ranchers, he's educating families. People are taking family vacations to his ranch. And there you have it. It's that's just how it works. And so the foundation as well, you know, we just had the biggest wildfire in Texas history. And that was just a couple of months old. A lot of people don't realize that was cattle country. 1.2 million acres were devastated. For the last you know, 60 days, I've been working closely with the producers and ranchers that got devastated by that wildfire. 1.2 million acres burned, folks. That has a huge impact on our cattle industry. And you go to iontexasslimfoundation.org, you're going to see all of our, our work, our relief. I just... Worked with three producers, ranchers, and a helicopter pilot two weeks ago. We spread eight tons of seed across the Texas panhandle on seven different ranches. Okay. That's over 65,000 acres that we were able to target with a helicopter, drop new seed in through the raining system, the, the rain system that we're hitting right now as far as the weather pattern. Now those seeds are getting planted. Restoration is coming back. We're going to do 10 more of those projects, but we need people feeding into the I'm Texas Slim Foundation to be able to afford that. Six hours in a helicopter costs $6,000. Eight tons of seed costs $18,000. We're working with other organizations, wildlife organizations, to hopefully get more seed donated. We can buy more fuel. We got ranchers waiting and said, we need seed over here in this watershed. Our cattle need it up here on this uh, mesa. We know where the seed needs to be planted. We just need more people coming in, donating, so we can facilitate these reseeding uh, projects. I'm a busy man these days. <laughs> uh, uh, and I love that it all kind of comes full circle that you were uh, sort of metaphorically planting the seeds of this idea right? and now you're actually physically out there planting the seeds to make it happen. Amazing work. Certainly appreciate everything you've doing. You've been doing all that I've learned from you through this project and excited to see where it continues to grow. Let people know, I guess, one more time where they should go to the website, how to follow you, how to connect with uh, you and the Beef Initiative. I'm going to ramble off a lot, but one thing that we didn't get to talk about, and I, you were part, you know, we hinted at it in Florida, and we're going to come back to Florida. So we're going to be back in Florida in November. So pay attention. And beefsummits.com, you can kind of see everything that we're doing as far as our conferences. But the Cattleman's Feast is cattlemansfeast.com. What that is, that's a wonderful production and we're going to have one in nashville it's going to be the biggest and the first one that we've ever done it's going to be at the bitcoin conference in nashville july 25th 26th and 27th we're going to have two cattlemen's feasts two nights of that come join us in nashville you guys have uh vip passes of course philip and jack so you don't worry about that <laughs> We'll get you there and uh, we can even house you if you need to. So we would love to have you there. We're going to have a stage, but cattlemansfeast.com. Uh, the Cattleman's Feast is going to replace the backyard barbecue because of what it's doing is it's showing everything that we've lost as far as the cuts of the cow on basically the preparation of uh, our wonderful animal that we all honor the cow. And we're going to show you every international flavor there is from the Texas cowboy to the gaucho to the vicero to every which way to, that you can prepare beef, the Cattleman's Feast is going to go global and we're going to show everybody, but we're going to start in Nashville, July 26th and 27th. 
And I tell you, it's going to be a hell of a ride. We're going to have something called the Tomahawk Ribeye Eating Contest. <laughs> all right. So all you carnivore influencers, if you want to go out there and really get some exposure, we're going to have at least 10 to 20 contestants that basically get to eat every bit of every tomahawk ribeye, two and a half pounds. You said you had a beef rib. My tomahawk ribeye is 2.5 pounds or three pounds a piece. And so we're going to have plenty of them there in Nashville and everybody's going to get up there and they're going to LARP their butts off on how much beef they can eat. And so we're going to make it a big old party, but we're going to have a Texas taco tango on Friday night. We're going to have a tomahawk ribeye eating contest. And then we're going to have the first ever international cattleman's feast right there next to Music City Center in Nashville, Tennessee, July 26th and 27th. But if you want to know just the easiest way to find out about the beef initiative, it's just welcome to beef.com. That's it. How easy is that? So That's simple and complicated. That's and it's the good. source of the seed, like you said, Philip. We're back to the getting to the source of the seed on how we feed ourselves, how we raise land, but most importantly, how do we save the health of our children moving forward? It's through the gates of the beef initiative. This is a great American health initiative, and it's being led by the great American rancher with stewards like Dr. Philip Ovedia, Jack, yourself, and all the doctors out there that have come through the gates of the beef initiative. It's time for everybody to collaborate, not compete against each other. Yep. So let's ever get everybody to Nashville in July. Leave your That's weenies good. at the door. This is not a hot dog eating contest. <laughs> the tomahawk ribeye eating contest uh, and so let's get busy awesome uh, that, so that's what sean baker's been training for exactly that's it. he inspired it right let's give it to sean so i'm going to start i'm going to start doing like sean did i'm going to start eating my own tomahawk ribeyes just like the old sean does on camera <laughs> let's get everybody just, doing that right let's I, get I everybody just, doing that yeah I, I tried to keep up with sean eating some tomahawk yeah. ribeyes this weekend and i'll say i I didn't have a chance, but it was still fun. You Very were in the good. heart of Texas with a, a lot of fantastic people down there in the heart of Texas. The one place you guys go to, look at Hometown Meats in Luling, Texas. That's Cole Bolton. Look up Rick Ranches in Colorado, Norfolk Valley. Jason Rick's doing it right. He's got an Airbnb. But you can find all these guys through the gates of the Beef Initiative. Just go searching. And then if you really get curious... Just do a hashtag beef intelligence and do a Google search on that. We've got a new algorithm going on. It's pretty fun. Oh, okay. I'm going to do that right now just because I think that sounds fun. Beef initiative. No, beef intelligence. Beef intelligence. Yeah, beef intelligence. Beef intelligence. Let's get to a new layer of beef intelligence across this world. Any browser that you use now, you're going to pop up a lot about the old beef initiative. We've been there working on that one too. We know a little bit about technology as well. So I like that. Love All it. right. Texas Slim, thanks for joining us, man. You bet, man. It's so uh, good it's... to see you guys. You know, we've been doing this for a while, right? We've known each yeah. other for a while. And everybody needs to understand that, you know, this came, you know, Philip, Jack, you saw this at the very beginning as well. Yeah. You know, we've been. You guys have been on this cattle drive with me for, you know, a long time now. Yeah. So let's spread it across the nation. Let's spread it across the world. It's what we need right now. It's what we need. Yep. Appreciate it, Slim. I appreciate you guys. We'll talk to you in All Nashville. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we'll make sure that as much as possible, everything that Slim referenced here in the show shows up in the show notes. So it'll all be there. That's the beef initiative and hashtag beef intelligence on Google. I just did that. It's pretty cool. It isn't. It? It's fun. All right. Let's go. Let's go. All right. For Dr. Philip Ovadia and Texas Slim, this has been Stay Off My Operating Table. We'll talk to you next time. Chances are you wouldn't be listening to this podcast if you didn't need to change your life and get healthier. So take action right now. Book a call with Dr. Ovadia's team. One small step in the right direction is all it takes to get started. Contact us at ifixhearts.com slash talk. That's ifixhearts, 
com slash talk.